In this PowerPoint, we want to talk about signal transduction pathways, and that's a concept that's new to most students coming into AP Biology. Um, what are we talking about with signaling pathways? We're really talking about how organisms are responsive to their environment. Um, oftentimes, organisms need to sense what's going on around them and then maybe change the activity of their cell in response. And so that's really what this is about. This is about how cells can be dynamic. They're not always just doing the same thing all the time. Um, they're talking to each other in the case of multicellular organisms. Sometimes cells in our body are sending messages to other cells to get them to change their activity. Even single-celled organisms are going to do the signaling pathways. Um, just a simple example would be a single-celled organism maybe detecting some kind of dangerous condition, and then maybe their response is to stop moving in that direction and maybe move in the opposite direction, right? So very simple signal response. Um, and then maybe the other idea I just want to get across with signaling pathways is that it's maybe really important for energy conservation. Cells aren't always making proteins, um, uh, all the proteins that, that are coded for in their DNA. That would be a tremendous waste of energy in, in amino acids. Um, so um, maybe the purpose of these signaling pathways is to um, only build the proteins when they're needed. Um, just to give you a simple example there, maybe you want to think about the, the bacteria that live in human intestines um, in our digestive system. So it would be very pointless for them to make all possible digestive enzymes for anything we might eat. Uh, so what they do instead is they just sort of wait to see what's going through our digestive system. Um, if, for example, I ate yogurt today, then they might sort of detect the milk sugar lactose that's around them, and that might trigger them to produce the lactose enzymes to specifically work with that sugar um, um, as their energy source. So. Signaling pathways are really universal in all living organisms. That's why they're so important. So let's talk about broadly how signaling pathways work. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit um, disappointed in how your book presents it because they give you so many example pathways and make it seem like you need to memorize all of these crazy kind of names of receptors and proteins. So what I'd really like to do instead is I'd like for you to just be able to kind of give me the broad steps of how any signaling pathway works. I'm going to give you a few examples of different types of receptors or, or, or um, proteins along the transduction pathway, um, but I'm just going to use them as examples and much more important to me is just the broader concept of what's happening. So you can think of, of the uh, broad steps here as, as being three. So um, you have to receive the signal first, then you have to convert that um, reception into some kind of cell activity. That's really what transduction means. We're just converting the fact that we've, we've um, received the chemical signal into intracellular activity. And then ultimately that intracellular activity needs to lead to some kind of appropriate response. And we'll try and outline what cells might do in response to receiving signals. So let's talk reception first. Um, and uh, and the really, the, again, the most important thing you can do for me, if you're in my class in particular, is you need to make sure all of your steps are connected together. If some kind of protein gets activated, you need to tell me what it's then doing to activate the next protein. Um, you can really um, use this metaphor of sort of like a line of dominoes, one hitting the other, which causes it to change, which causes it to hit the next one. And you need to make sure your steps are as connected as the domino story would be. All right, so let's talk about reception first. Step one in any signaling pathway is we have to detect the signal at, fir uh, uh, at first. And so there's a class of proteins called receptor proteins. We introduced them in previous units, and now we're really interested in them. Uh, receptor proteins are often found in the cell membrane facing out. Um, proteins always have specific three-dimensional shapes, in this case also receptor proteins. They might have one little subregion or domain that has the perfect shape to fit a particular chemical. And so if a cell needs to detect a particular signal, then they'll have receptor proteins with shapes to fit that signal. Um, we have a name for that signal. Um, we often call it a ligand. Ligands are often chemicals. So if you think about like chemical hormones, um, if you've heard of the term hormone before, a hormone is simply released by one cell to go 
um, connect to the receptor protein of another cell and get it to change its behavior. Um, but ligands don't always have to be chemicals. They might be other things like light, for example. I have light receptors in cells in the back of my eye um, that receive light as their ligand. So some kind of signal that you're receiving. Um, and just a brief aside, sometimes receptors might actually be in the cytoplasm. So in, in some cases, chemical ligands might be very nonpolar and be able to cross right through the membrane and bind to its receptor inside the cell. Um, that's not very important to me. Okay, so we've talked about reception. Now we're ready to talk about how that eventually causes changes within the cell. So we need to talk about transduction first. How is that reception converted into cellular activity? So the first step of transduction has to be that the receptor, upon binding to the ligand, changes its own shape. If you're thinking of a membrane receptor, it's important that the receptor changes shape inside the cell. And typically what this is going to do is it's going to open up a binding site inside the cell that was previously closed that might allow another protein to bind there and perhaps get activated itself. So in this little picture down here, uh, maybe GRB2 was previously inactive. These, these proteins all have terrible names, by the way, so just um, don't let that intimidate you. Um, GRB2 was previously inactive, and maybe, um, maybe after this receptor protein bound to the ligand, here's the ligand binding, Maybe that caused the receptor protein to change shape right around here in such a way that this protein could now bind there itself. Maybe that causes this protein to change shape somewhere else. Um, and maybe it opens up a new binding site in it that allows the next protein to bind. And that's where you're starting to see the domino story. Right? Maybe it's just this constant stream of, of proteins getting activated, their shape changes, and that allows the next protein in the line to be activated itself. So um, I really just kind of um, captured that this uh, PowerPoint slide already. Uh, maybe that causes the next protein to, to change shape. And maybe there's this chain of activations where proteins are getting activated, their shape is changing, a new binding site is opening, and the next protein can bind there and become active itself. So um, the next few slides just talk about a few specific examples of how this might work. Do you need to memorize all of them that I'm about to cover with you? No, um, but maybe you could give me at least a few examples. So let's just kind of be a little bit more specific. Um, somewhere in many signaling pathways, one of the, the proteins that might be activated are just proteins called kinases. Kinases are basically enzymes that can bind to other proteins as their substrate and also bind to ATP. And basically what the kinase will do when it itself is activated is they will collide with the next protein in the signaling pathway, and they will um, find ATP as well, and they will take that protein, take a phosphate off of ATP, and basically attach it to the uh, protein in the, the next part of the signaling pathway. Or they're just going to phosphorylate that next protein, and maybe that's what that next protein needs to change its shape somewhere else and go and, and activate the next protein in the line. So one way to transduce the signal is to involve a kinase, and kinases just activate the next protein by phosphorylating them. Another way to potentially pass the signal on is to um, have a, a protein that's maybe inactive at first. And um, when a protein is activated itself, it might activate this next protein by cutting it up a little bit. And by cutting it up a little bit, what it's actually doing is it's sort of removing the inhibitory part of that uh, uh, molecule. And, and sort of the cut up part is now activated and ready to go activate the next guy. Um, uh, just a, a simple metaphor for this is you can sort of activate a pen with a cap on it by removing the inhibitory cap, and now that pen is ready to do its job and, and write.
Um, so similarly, maybe um, there's a protein here called phospholipase C. Don't worry about these names. Maybe it was activated in an earlier step, and it activates the next step in the pathway by finding this whole complex called PIP2, and it actually cuts it. Um, and it removes kind of this inhibitory part, and it's this IP3 little um, subunit that is actually the active part that once freed can go and bind to the next protein. In this case, it looks like it's binding to the allosteric site of a transport protein and maybe changing its shape to allow molecules to um, come out of, of some location. So um, sometimes you can cut a protein and activate it. Um, and there's actually potentially the other idea as well. I'm sorry I don't have a picture for this, but I'm going to show you this in a video in my class. Sometimes you do just the opposite. Sometimes you allow pieces to come together. None of the pieces themselves are active. But once they're able to combine, that combined structure is the activated protein. So sometimes you sort of activate the next protein in the cycle by sort of putting it together, and then it goes on to activate something else. Let's actually go back to that picture because this picture does show another example of another way to activate the next step in the process. Sometimes the next step in the process is a transport protein and when it sort of um, activates and maybe releases an ion or some kind of small molecule um, from some kind of storage center, in this case the endoplasmic reticulum, um, maybe that ion itself can bind to the allosteric site of the next protein and cause it to change shape. So sometimes when it's just like a little chemical like that, we call it the second messenger. Um, why the second messenger? Because maybe the first messenger was the initial ligand that bound to the receptor protein. So um, a, a, a very common example of a second messenger chemical is calcium. It just isn't always calcium, so you don't want to go too far with that. But if you wanted to jot that down as an example, go ahead. All right, so um, what have we done? We've talked about a lot of different ways that the, 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 the signal is sort of passed from protein to protein, um, activating proteins by changing their shape, and then we tried to be a little bit more specific and talk about um, different uh, specific ways that, that the next protein might be activated. So if you're starting to wonder, this is great, but what the heck is the point of this? Well, um, eventually we want to get to some kind of appropriate response. So let's maybe just sort of outline what, what might happen in very broad signaling pathways. Maybe the goal is finally just to activate this final protein at the end of the chain, and that was the protein you were trying to activate kind of in the first place. Um, what would be some examples of this? Maybe we want to turn on metabolic pathway that was previously off. Um, in the case of those digestive, uh, those bacteria in the digestive system, maybe we want to activate currently existing lactase enzymes to break down that lactose milk sugar I was talking about. Uh, maybe they were there the whole time, but rather than spend a bunch of ATP um, um, not you know doing worthless tasks, maybe we only want to have them active when it's appropriate, right? Um, in some other cases, maybe we just want to open up a transport protein that was previously closed. Maybe we only want to let particles in when um, the, the time is appropriate. Um, just in brief preview, we're going to see that nerves are a major example of this idea. Um, they're going to have transport proteins that only open when we want to send an electrical signal. That's really like their way of response. Your book's going to call this the cytoplasmic response, and I, I just I'm not that concerned with that name as much as the idea. Maybe there are already existing proteins that are there, and we just want to turn them on. Let's say that might be an appropriate response. The other broad type of response that your book calls the nuclear response, um, again, I don't care about that name really, but the idea is that maybe we want to tell the cell to build new proteins that maybe aren't in the cytoplasm already or otherwise modify the rate of new protein production. Um, so I just gave an example where maybe we want to activate previously inactive DNA code. 
um, but there are also times where the signaling pathway might quiet down um, production of a certain protein. Um, so you can modify it in both ways. Maybe you want to tell a cell, hey, you're currently making that protein, but now we don't want you to make any more of that protein, or vice versa. And so I just want to introduce the name of the proteins that do this. Um, we're going to talk about transcription factor proteins much more in the molecular genetics unit. But that's the broad class of proteins who, once activated themselves, their job is to have specific three-dimensional shapes that enable them to bind to very specific regions of DNA code. And by binding there, they might alter the rate that certain DNA code is copied or read to make new proteins. Um, they alter the level of transcription, if you remember that term. So um, again, I'm just introducing that term in this unit. We'll say much more about them later. So um, here's just sort of um, one example of how ridiculously complicated signaling pathways can be. Um, there's a lot of research going into signaling pathways because they're, they're relatively new in cell biology and very exciting because we're starting to unravel this complicated web of how do cells respond um, to, to um, certain environmental stimuli. So um, signaling pathways can be very complicated, but all you need to know for our course and introduction is just the broad three steps and be able to walk me through the steps and how it's all connected. Reception of the initial ligand, transduction of that reception into intracellular activity, and then some kind of appropriate response.